If you would indulge me, I am going to read from a different translation of the same text, Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 6, which will be our context for today. And this is how it reads from the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flocks? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched to look for them. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, may the words from my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, I ask that you would hide this humble servant behind the cross, that we may only see your guiding light and soften his voice, that we may only hear your redeeming words. And God, help me make your word easy to remember. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to preach from a different subject that is in your bulletin, and the subject is scattered sheep. Let's go get them. Scattered sheep. Let's go get them. I was reading a Facebook post from one of my retired colleagues in the ministry, and he posted something that was actually quite disturbing to me. And what he said was, I left the United Methodist Church as a straight alley pastor because I could no longer participate in an environment controlled by so-called Christians who worked so hard to oppress and destroy beloved children of God. End quote. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that came from a pastor in my denomination. The comment that he made actually had no context. It was just that phrase. But I would also imagine that this view about the United Methodist Church could be transferred to any faith tradition that doesn't embrace change, and in some cases, simply forgets its history. Does anyone know the true history of the Methodist Church? and its basic formula for discipleship? Anyone know what it is? It's called the three simple rules. Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. Say it with me. Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. These are the Three simple rules that John Wesley laid out for the Methodists in order that we may continue to flourish in our witness to God. Debbie Nixon and Adam Hamilton wrote these words. As the body of Christ, we have a great responsibility to represent God's physical and moral presence in the world, to be outwardly focused, going into the community, casting the net wide, reaching the lost, end quote. With just three simple rules, do you think that that could be difficult? Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. Just three simple rules. The answer is, it can be. Not everyone is comfortable meeting new people. Isn't that true? And let's be honest, some new people don't want to be met. However, as Christians, the Great Commission was not given to us as an option. It was a commission, a responsibility, a higher calling beyond ourselves. When mommy and daddy or or my auntie or anyone told me to clean up my room, that was not an option for me growing up. They told you to do something. It was your responsibility to do it. And once upon a time, I may have shared this story with you, and I thought it was appropriate for the day because it is, in fact, Mother's Day. 
I remember I had to been about maybe seven or eight, and I was going through the supermarket with my mother, and I was knocking things off the shelf. My mother said to me, Marlon, you need to stop doing that. And so we kept going a little further. I knocked something else off the shelf. My mother said, this is your last warning. We turn the corner, get, on, get into another aisle. I knock something else off the shelf. The next thing I remember is getting up off the floor. <laughs> and my mother was turning the aisle to the next aisle. Back then, the things we saw on TV when that woman went to go get her child who was down there rioting was common nature. I turned out all right. <laughs> Y'all turned out all right. <laughs> the Great Commission, it's not an option for us. It's our responsibility to go forth and preach the gospel, preaching the good news, doing what God called us and commanded us to do. And we have to understand that there are, for every action, there is a consequence. For every action, there is a consequence, and it is our responsibility to fulfill that commission. Well, the same was true for the Israelites. Actions, consequences. They were scattered and enslaved because they had forgotten the three simple rules. What are they? Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. And in this story from the prophet Ezekiel, the burden was placed on the shepherds who had forgotten the three simple rules. And a shepherd was, and still is today, a common metaphor for leaders of a family or a faith tradition, a pastor, a minister, parents, grandparents, anyone who takes on the responsibility to lead others is considered a shepherd. So what I'd like to do today is take this indictment that was placed on the shepherds and turn it around. I'd like to take this Old Testament indictment upon the shepherds and turn it into a New Testament excitement. So we're going to go from indictment to excitement. Amen? And I want us to be part of that change, part of that witness as disciples, as we witness as a church. And as we look at this text, scatter sheep, let's go get them. Ezekiel. 34, beginning with verse 1b. The sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? What did this scripture look like if we were actually put it in the affirmative? It says that turn our focus into the needs of the community. And what needs do the community have? Well, there are a number of ways in which we can find out. We can attend community association meetings. There are at least four that most of you are members of. You're either a part of Sudbrook Park, Willow Glen South, Villa Villanova, or Colonial Village. Anyone in, in any of those communities? Sure you are. I know because I know where you live. <laughs> we need to go to some of these meetings. Find out what are the needs of the community and how can we plug into those needs so that we might meet the needs of the community. But there's also parent teachers associations. Uh, Karen, do a lot of p parents come to those PTA meetings? No. Well, guess what? No, that's right. They don't come. But guess what? We could go because we can be the ones who can actually make a difference by showing up and saying that we care. We can actually turn, attend these meetings, find out what the needs are, and then try to address them. The only way we're really gonna make a difference in the life of the church is that we have to be motherly, to love these children with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and literally embrace them in a way that makes a difference in their lives. There's also school improvement team meetings. They still call them that, school improvement team meetings. Well, now they bring in the concerns of not only the community people, but also the teachers and the faculty come together to talk about things that need to happen in the church. I've attended two of those so far. I plan to attend more. Some of those are doing in the afternoon, so I get to get my schedule together. 
But at the end of the day, I'm wondering, I'm asking all of us a question. If I gave you the dates of these meetings, would you go with me? That's a question. If I gave you the dates, would you go with me? Some of them. <laughs> and if I couldn't go, would you go in my stead? Hmm. Scattered sheep. Let's go get them. The text goes on to say in verse 3, you eat the curds, clothe yourself in wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. What does this text mean in the affirmative? Well, let me give you an example. Are there any clothes or shoes, and I mean the good stuff, in your home that you no longer wear? I mean, you still got tags on them. Some of them are a size 28, and you know you are a size 32. <laughs> and you ain't never getting back to 28. I'm prophesying to myself now. But you remember what you looked like when you was in. And so they just sit in that tub, never being given away to anybody that could use them. Amen? What if we took some of those clothes? And I'm talking about the good. Remember, I did say the good stuff. I'm not talking about anything that Fred Sanford would not accept. Now, for any of you who don't know who Fred Sanford is, he was a junk dealer who took everything. So if Fred Sanford wouldn't take it, don't bring it here. And now I'm giving you a hint about the flea market, amen? That's a tip. Don't bring nothing here that no. <laughs> you just want us to take it to the dump for you. You knew it was trash when you got But we have an opportunity twice a year when we have a flea market to bring things that others could benefit from. Sometimes we don't even have to sell it. We could just simply give it away because someone else needs it. We could take some of these clothes or some of these trinkets and maybe open up a little secondhand store. I've seen many churches do that. And just to benefit the community. You know you're not going to fit that again. You know that little trinket that you bought or someone gave to you as a gift that you're never going to use, but could be useful for someone else, could be brought, and it could be given to someone else in need. You eat the curds and slaughter the choice animals. Now, this is going to get a little sensitive. Are you eating those rich foods or healthy foods? You know what I'm talking about. All that food sautéed in butter. Nice, fancy restaurants. Of which I go to once in a while, don't get me wrong. But there's something I'd like for you to know. Those healthy foods are a bit more expensive. Anybody? They're a bit more expensive. However, your life will be richer by eating them. Your mind will be clearer. Your skin will be clearer. Your attitude will be clearer. And there's a tip that we learned from the Daniel plan, and that is if you simply shop on the periphery of the grocery store, those are the fresher foods. It's when you get inside to those uh, processed foods, the things that are faster, I understand it's faster. But when you get to those processed foods, then you end up adding more salt and things to your body that you just don't need. The body has enough salt of its own, believe it or not. You eat the curds and slaughter the choice animals, but are you indeed eating healthier that you can be a better witness to others? Verse 4a, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. Now this may sound like a repeat from last week, but we're all called to visit and be a part of the witness of visiting our shut-in here at the church, perhaps family members, or even the using the World Wide Web. 
With that source, you can literally be in front of someone through Skype, FaceTime, Google Conference, you name it. There are numerous ways in which we can share the gospel with the click of a button and share the word of God that may encourage others in their lives. And I don't know, for any of you who attended the service for the beloved Jalen Barber, little girl, eight years old, we, we, we offered everything to the family. We, we gave them money. We, we, we allowed them to, to be here with us in worship. We, 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 we allowed them to use the fellowship hall. And, and that was us being the church. Didn't cost them a dime. They weren't members of the church. Work with me. They weren't members of the church, but they will be on next week. See how that works? When you're actually being disciples of Jesus Christ, when you're actually doing something without looking for a return, there are scattered sheep out there. We need to go get them. And just this week alone, no, it would be last week because today is the first day of the week. Last week, I was in two meetings. I was in the Subbrook Community Association annual meeting, of which I didn't see any of you. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I was at the, the Boston Market on Righteous Town Road. And in both of those instances, people came up to me and said, you look familiar. Are you the pastor from Milford Mill United Methodist Church, the one who did that service for Jalen Barber? I said, yes, I am. She said that was a wonderful service. What a beautiful church. She was talking about us. She was talking about us. There are scattered sheep out there. We need to go get them. She's just not going to show up at our doorstep. Today alone, Mother's Day, Chris asked, are, any, are there any new guests? And for the first time in many, many days, no one stood. We need to go get them. There are scattered sheep out there. We need to go get them. And then in verse 4b, you have not brought back the strays or search for the lost. We were supposed to print some names. I don't believe they made it into the bulletin this Sunday, but they will be posted very soon of individuals who uh, we do not have addresses or phone numbers for. And this came about as an exercise when we started looking at the, uh, the new photo directory and realized that we don't have contact for some of these individuals. And so it, it dawned on me that there, there are some people missing. And I remember at one point in time, I used to say, y'all remember I used to say, at the end of your pews, put in the register those who are missing in your pews. You remember that? But it got to be a point that was almost like a cliche, and I stopped doing it. But there are people who are now missing from our congregation. And we need to reach out to them, find out, making sure that they're at least in a church home. If, they're not, if they weren't happy here, make sure they're in a church home because God forbid they left the church altogether. God forbid. If there's anything that we can do to reconcile that situation, we should be about it. And let's be honest. It is the pastor's responsibility to look after the sheep. But last I checked, the Great Commission was for all of God's children. And you know, amen on that one. And as I close, beginning with verse 4c, we have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the world, all the wild animals. I've been told at times harsh and even brutal words have been shared among us. And as a result of these words and actions, some members have moved on to other churches and sadly left the church entirely. So, I would like to apologize on my behalf and others in asking God's forgiveness for anything said or done that was not of God's will. In church, I'd like to share this good news with you. I am not the same pastor that walked in here 
on July the 1st, 2009. I'm also not the same pastor from just a few months ago because, church, I've been redeemed. I have a new attitude about where we need to be, and I pray that you are on the same page with me because the text is very clear. There are some scattered sheep out there. It's time for us to go get them. And all that John Wesley shared with them and it's just three simple rules. Stand with me. Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. And the church said, Amen. <laughs>